So once again, as usual, we are off to the races. So when you start looking at this FreeBSD32 copy and control function, given that I've told you that buffling and buff are attacker controlled length and a buffer that the attacker controls in user space, then you go through, you find buff length is being aligned, so buff length still attacker controlled. And then at this point, buff length is con compared to MCL bytes, and this is 2048, if you looked at the definition of that. So I'm going to go ahead and s represent buffling as a sassy value after this point, because basically it has to be uh, less than or equal to 2048. It is a unsigned int, so there's not uh, any playing games with signedness here. So it is less than or equal to 2048. All right, then you continue on. You reach a little bit of initialization. That's good. Index of zero, length of zero. While index, which is zero, is left less than this 2048 or smaller value, then there is a copy in. And if you looked at the definition of copy in, you'd see that the first parameter is a user space buffy, buffer and the second parameter is the kernel space buffer. In this case, it's just this local variable. So we've got attacker controlled buffer pointer down in user space somewhere, plus index, index is zero at this point. And whatever it finds there is going to be copied into this buffer where the buffer is just the address of the local variable message length and the size is the size of message length. So that's not attacker controlled. So it's going to get you exactly one of these message length values into there, but that is going to be an attacker controlled size. Then we've got a whole bunch of sanity checks, which is good. We've got if message length is less than the size of the struct, then that's a problem. So now we're going to again represent this as sassy. Then you've got some alignment, sassy data, still sassy. Then you've got a check and a comparison if the message length, which is sassy, plus the index is greater than the overall buffer length, then that would also be an error. So we said that, you know, if the overall buffer is 2048 or smaller, and all of a sudden you're saying, oh yeah, my message length for this particular struct field is 4096, then that's going to obviously be an error because that would be requesting more data than should exist in the overall buffer. So that's good. Then you do an index plus equals message length, and that's how you get from one of those header structures to the next header structure. And then you've got some further alignment, and that's just going to keep this message length as a sassy value. And then ultimately, this aligned value is added into the length. So within this loop, the length is essentially going to be a running total of the total lengths specified by all of the data structures in that buffer. So you can definitely tell when a programmer knows how to program Paranoid because this is good. This is lots of sanity checks, and that's exactly the kind of thing I want to see. Of course, while they did do the sanity checks and they did the right things in terms of unsigned values instead of signed values, that kind of stuff. So this, this example is going to show you exactly why we need to learn about these things sequential. First, we need to learn about, you know, doing our sanity checks. But then we have to see that things like race conditions can actually allow for an attacker to bypass the, all of these sanity checks. And in so doing, they can ultimately reopen the typical heap buffer overflows. So it turns out that this right here is our first fetch of something that is going to be double fetched. Specifically, this length is double fetched. And so at this point, we're only fetching it in order to build up our running total of length but we're going to double fetch it later on and use it for buffer copying. So here is how I said I wanted to represent this data structures in buff. It was three instances of header and then data, header and then data. So this first instance is fetched and that ultimately goes into the length. So that is the first fetch of a coming double fetch vulnerability. And immediately after that's been fetched, you can start your engines because we're off to the races. If that's ever going to be double fetched again, if the attacker can get in here during that race window and change it out, then we're going to have a problem. So all of these, as I said, are fetched and ultimately summed into this total overall length. Okay, so then continuing on with the code, we have this check for the length, which is the summed length. Is it greater than MCL bytes, which was the 2048? And this is kind of the final time of check to ensure that it won't, you know, overflow an mbuff cluster. That's what the MCL bytes stands for. But you could also argue that these are the earlier time of checks. So in terms of there being a time of check, time of use, double fetch, race condition, these are some checks on these lengths, but this is the sort of final check. 
Then the code proceeds down to mget, which is going to get an mbuf, which is a special type of data structure that's used for uh, handling network packet data and this socket data behind the scenes. So it gets an mbuf, and then it checks is the length greater than mlang, which is 256. And if it was, then it would go down here and call this, but the attacker can choose to have this be true or not. So for now, let's just assume that it's not actually going to go into that condition. Then you have the sassy length being passed in to the mbuf mlength field. And so if we visualize what's going on here, the thing has already summed up all of these lengths right here. But as soon as it pulled in each of those in the first fetch, now the attacker can start the racing and they can just completely swap those out. So by the time it gets past this code, it will use one length based on the initial clean values and it'll put that into the M length field. But then by the time this code comes again to fetch these fields, these are going to be swapped out with acid lengths, which could sum to a completely different and of course larger length. And of course the attacker could actually really just swap out everything in here. They can change the entire buffer while the kernel is operating on uh, the data that it read in the first time. So when we continue to follow the code from there, we have this m2d. This is an mbuf to data buffer. It's basically just pulling out a field within the mbuf uh, structure and that's like just a normal pointer to the normal data. So it pulls that out, and right now that's filled in with nothing. It's just, you know, pointing at wherever it's pointing at, and it's uninitialized. I guess I should have written that as uh, gray for uninitialized, but it's not filled in with anything. And more to the point, it's not attacker controlled. So then that buff length, which is 2048 or smaller, while that's greater than zero, then it's going to call copy in on the buff, which is the user space fully attacker controlled buffer with the kernel side data buffer, which is unfilled in, and it's going to copy in a struct worth of data. But this is going to copy acid into that kernel space buffer, and indeed this is a second fetch, bad 2-2. So let's visualize what's happening there. We've got the clean mbuf, we've got the clean mbuf data, we've got the sassy buff length, but the copy in is pointing at this acid buffer in user space. This MD, uh, again, I kind of drew this wrong the first time, but then it was too much work to, to change it out. Inside the M buff, there is the M underscore data field. That's going to be a pointer pointing out to some other buffer somewhere else. That's really what that is, but I'm just going to show it inside of the this M buff uh, blue box for now. But the point is, it copies one of these structs in, and that is the second fetch of this data, right? The C message lang had already been fetched to sum up the total data size that it expected it was going to be operating on to sanity check it. But when it fetches it again here, it has fetched it after the race allows the attacker to change out the contents. And that is the double fetch vulnerability. It's now fetching an acid ball. So back in the code, the copy in occurred. The MD is now holding acid from the attacker. And the first thing we see is that it dereferences that as a unsigned integer pointer. And that was actually pulling the now acid C message length field out of the header, right? So it copied in a header worth of data starting at the beginning of the buffer. That header had a C message length at the beginning. This now dereferences as a unsigned int. And so therefore the C message length is getting placed into the message length. Then we've got a whole bunch of alignment stuff, which I'm going to skip so I don't have to animate all of that. But then eventually it gets down to here. Still acid, just aligned acid. Message length, is it greater than zero? Yes, it is. So that's going to be used as the length to copy in from user space to kernel space into this MD, this data buffer location. And the data buffer had been sort of moved forward as a result of the copy in before, so now it's pointing after the header. And so this right here is the time of use. We had a bunch of checks before, but then race conditions allowed for swapping data out, and this is the time of use. And it's time of use for a mem copy equivalent copy in. And that's not safe. That's our classic sweet potato case, sweet potato root cause. We've got an acid, acid data coming from user space being copied into a sassy length destination buffer, just subject to a few sanity size, uh, sanity checks on its size. Fully attacker controlled length with a mem copy equivalent. That's a sweet potato, and that's no good.
And so here you can see that we have just a basic heap overflow. That's all thanks to the time of check, time of use, double fetch race condition. So just like we saw with integer overflows as a way to reopen the door to basic buffer overflows, this race condition, this time of check, time of use has opened up a classic heap overflow. So visualizing that, that would look something like this. We've got the acid C message length being used for a copy in. The destination is past the end of the header. The source is all of this data that is acid coming from user space. But because it's an attack controlled length, this is of course going to be a giant over copy and that's going to lead to a basic kernel heap overflow. And with that, the attacker has successfully won the race, the race condition derby. So yes, this is the eye of how time of check, time of use. That is a double fetch. That is also a race condition. So what was the fix? Well, the fix was relatively complicated. We can see there's a decent amount of reworking here, but the gist of it and the net result is that they're doing the thing when you have double fetches, how do you fix it? You fit, fetch once and only once, and then you operate on your fetched copy. So now they copy the entire big old buffer in and then they parse and process all of this data from here instead of refetching it from user space later on. So that exclusive access, that mutual exclusion so that the attacker can't change this stuff out in kernel space because they've already copied all of the user space stuff, that is an appropriate fix for this type of vulnerability.